Gracious and loving God, for this time together, we're so grateful. We pray that our hearts and minds are prepared to hear the good news you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as somebody alluded last week, I had just gotten off a plane and home, and I left my notes last week. So I'm going to do a recap of chapter three because I, I missed a few of the things that I had wanted to say. So um, just a quick recap, Romans 3, 1 through 8. Paul resumes his diatribe style of argumentation, asking a series of questions designed to engage the Romans and by extension, our faith understanding. I like to think of it when he gets really argumentative like that. I used to be in speech and debate, so it kind of gets me all excited. But think about it like volleyball. So if, stand up, she's here and she just does this really easy ball up, and then what can I do? <laughs> Smash it down. That's what his questions are. Now you want me to sit down? Now you can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just say, was, I was on a state champion. Uh, <laughs> 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 I had a sense. I could just feel her volleyball aura. <laughs> so that's kind of what he's doing here. So he asks questions. What's the advantage? is being a Jew, God's chosen, circumcised, a steward of the law or the Torah when their salvation has been annulled by their failure to live according to the law. Does human failure, excuse me, human failure, even failure of God's chosen people compromise the character of God who is true even if everyone is a liar? And if human sinfulness accentuates God's holiness, why should God judge sinners? In fact, why shouldn't God's people sin all the more to heighten God's holiness? So having thrown out these questions, he gives us a one-liner. Um, anybody who doesn't get the right answer here, your condemnation is deserved, is, is how he, he ends that. So I, I, I like Paul, but I'm from New York, and I just find his you know sort of combative way in the world yeah. it makes you think and he doesn't want us to be mamby pamby believers he wants us to be engaged so in romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 19 paul gives a measured answer to these questions observing both jews and he says greeks but remember we read that gentiles okay um all are under the power of sin Paul then recalls from memory no less than seven proof texts from the Hebrew scriptures attesting to human moral unrighteousness and the resultant impossibility of salvation by works. Paul concludes by categorically and universally condemning humankind as unrighteous. Through the law, we've come to the knowledge of sin, not how to live righteously, or put another way, everyone falls short of fulfilling the law, everyone sins. Now here, I'd like to pause and just throw out some applications that I hope are relevant to us in our time and culture. I'm gonna guess that I am not the only person who was raised in this room to obey the rules, to work hard in school, to be a productive citizen in my community, to apply myself sacrificially in my chosen vocation, and to make an effort to be an appealing person to be around. Anybody else grow up like that? All right. So maybe you've even encouraged your children to do those things. And I have to say this formula really works for getting affirmation from parents, teachers, and employers for achieving a measure of worldly success. And for the purposes of getting our lives started and, and working, it really, it works. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying all it does, and this is in the terms of um, Richard Rohr, we had a, a, a wintertime book study of a book by Richard Rohr called falling upwards spirituality in the second half of life <clears throat> and what he says is 
that kind of living makes for a great container for our lives, right? But that's all it is, is it's the outward container and it's what you put inside the container that's so important. So, the problem comes when we apply this formula of earning our success to our faith journey. If we think we can earn God's love, we will be sorely disappointed. I'm sure you have an inner critic. I certainly do. And my inner critic is so good at pointing out my flaws <laughs> that I would never be able to accept God's love because I would be too clear about where I fall short. Yeah. Is that connecting for anybody, yeah. I hope? So it's really important for us to recognize that just because that formula works for our container, it's not going to work for our soul. And I think that if we think Paul's argument here isn't relevant, it's really relevant in our lives if we'll just shift how we're looking at it a little bit. I'd also like to point out that there is a false teaching that is a heresy in our time called the prosperity gospel. Yeah. A lot of people have been deeply damaged by this. I see it at the hospital in the emergency department when people who have accepted that way of seeing the world they or a member of their family has an accident and a major life setback and their faith understanding falls apart so I have some rather negative energy towards it could you explain that prosperity gospel yes a it's better? a heresy that proclaims that your good works in particular very positive speech, holy living, and most important, making donations mm -hmm. to religious causes. It's called seeding. Mm -hmm. So I, I give money to you, and then that seeds the ground for God to be giving lots of money to me. Thank you. That results in some very well-to-do preachers and some very poor followers. Mm -hmm. um, the and, prosperity, uh, yeah? Just following up because of the connection to the hospital. People think that they are owed good health because of those contributions as well. Yes. And, and can't handle sickness or, no. or accidents. You're exactly right. Uh, and it's, they're devastated. Mm -hmm. And I, as a hospital chaplain, deal with that devastation. So I'm, I can't say, what I can't say to them, I'm saying to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so this prosperity theology views the God, Bible as a contract between God and humans, strong faith and good works equals God delivering you security and prosperity. And this is really damaging. So I want to come as, bring us back. Let Paul's argument sink in. None of us are righteous and there is nothing that we can be to can be or do to be righteous enough for God, period. Not even on the table, okay? Now we're gonna jump into Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 31, righteousness through faith. In Romans 3, 21 through 31, Paul resumes the theme of the letter of Romans, chapter one, verses 16 and through 17. And we'll keep coming back to those two verses, but just to remind you, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith, for faith, as it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Paul declares that the death of Jesus Christ fully atoned for humanity's sinfulness as demonstrated in Romans 18 through 20. God's righteousness is freely offered to sinners who receive it by faith as an unmerited gift of grace. How many of you have held in your arms a little baby, maybe it's 
a grandchild, maybe it's a niece or a nephew, maybe it's a friend's baby, maybe it was your own. When you hold that baby, what do you feel? A welling up and a love. I ask you, did that baby do anything to deserve all that love that you feel? Absolutely not. So if you have a hard time understanding this gift of grace, just identify with that place in your own life and know that is how God feels about you, only more so. You are God's beloved daughter, the apple of God's eye. From the moment that you were just itty bitty cells growing in your mother's womb, God knew you and loved you. God has been walking the way with you. The problem is not with God. <laughs> the problem is with us. Are we able to be open to receive the gift of God's grace? Or have we put this formula, which I add, it works. I used to be a school teacher. I liked kids who wanted to behave in my classroom. I'm not saying that that's not good and important in its place, but that's not how we are known and loved by God. Make sense? Okay. So now we jump back into this. In yeah. Question. Well, I just want to connect that with the, with atonement, but we don't have to do that now. Okay. I, we will get there. So, God's righteousness is freely offered to sinners who receive it by faith as an unmerited gift of grace. We only need be willing to receive it. Once we've received it, what happens? We go through a shift inside, right? We want to be at one with God, atonement, at one meant. We want to connect and be at one with God because God loved us first, not because of anything we initiated. So that's a beginning to, to that. In Romans 3.28, Paul gives a concise summary of the gospel. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The notion of justification by faith is particularly well articulated by N.T. Wright on page 62, so I'm just going to read it. Um, well, actually, I'm going to start on 61. First, justification by faith, as I emphasize itself, as I emphasized in the previous passage, oh, blah, 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 okay, I'll go. <laughs> it doesn't mean God isn't interested in holiness. It doesn't mean that rules don't matter, that anything goes, so that as long as you have faith of whatever kind, it doesn't mean that whatever matters is feelings or emotion rather than belief and behavior. It certainly doesn't mean that God tried to make good people by giving them moral works to do and finding that to be too difficult for them lowered the bar to make things easier. It means something clear, more robust, bracing, and indeed shocking. Are you ready to be shocked? Yes. It means that when people believe this particular message that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and trust themselves to the God who has done this, they are assured in the present time that they are part of God's family. This is not because there is anything meritorious in that belief, as though it were, after all, something we do to earn God's favor. Rather, it is because this faith is the sure and unfailing sign that the gospel has transformed the heart of the person concerned so that they now truly belong to the new covenant. Faith, as Paul says later in the letter, comes from hearing and hearing from the proclaimed word of the Messiah. And then he goes on from there. I'd also like to throw in another idea is our faith and understanding of Christ. Jesus invites us to model our lives after him, yes? Mm -hmm. And he literally dies. He takes all the anger and frustration and 
hostility that all these people throw at him, and does he strike back? He absorbs it, he dies, and rises to new life. That is a pattern, I promise you, if you haven't encountered it, and you probably have, you will. We're constantly having to die to certain things. I have three children who have grown up and have, are in the process of becoming independent human beings, right? I've had to die to being the center of my children's universe. That was before they were five. Then I had to, <laughs> I thought being the parent of a teenager involved a lot of dying <laughs> of one's identity, of oneself as being, um, you know, without certain flaws. My children were really good at pointing that out to me. But I, with a little humor, I, I'm saying that we have to die to certain things so that we can rise and we get lots of practice at this if we are open and we see this pattern in our lives. And I think that's part of what this teaching is about as well. So now we are ready for Romans 4. And having set this stage with this rigorous study, I want to go for a little um, diversion and tell you a story. There are these two young fish and they're swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on a bit and they eventually, one looks to the other and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> now, I stole this from David Foster Wallace, a highly regarded American writer, and he was in a, he was in a speech and he went on to say, quote, "The immediate point of the fish story is that the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. Mm -hmm. So all of us happen to be United States citizens living in the 21st century. We are all pretty much, I'm guessing, coming from a European background. Mm -hmm. And we all live in, compared to people in the rest of the world, very comfortable circumstances. So we don't necessarily think about that but that's just part of the water we swim in, right? And in our worldview, the emphasis is more on the individual, right? So what I would like to invite us to do is try to enter into the way of thinking of Paul and the people in the first century, and this will help us get Abraham better. You're wondering like, why is she doing this? Honestly, I have a purpose for it. But we identify as individuals in our country. We're very individual focused. And Paul is not only looking at individual, but family. Do you remember? He talks about the family of God. So Abraham is a father or a father figure. And what are the three Abrahamic religions? Anybody know what they are? Susan? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They are called the Abrahamic religions because all three of them recognize Abraham as the father figure for them. And so one of the things that Paul will be doing, and I want you to just have an ear out for it and be aware of it in all of chapter four and throughout the book of Romans, is not only speaking to us as individuals, but also as part of worshiping communities and part of a family and the family of God. And what does that mean when parts of the family are in conflict with each other, okay? So just bringing that awareness 
to us. So now, finally, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, God's covenant with Abraham. In Roman, in this selection, Paul points to Abraham who believed in God to illustrate justification by faith. So I'm going to just read a, um, what is it, what translation do I have? New Revised Standard Version. When then are we to say, what then are we to say was gained by Abraham our ancestor according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts in him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from work. Blessed are those who inequities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. So um, one reason that this argument of Paul's is notable is that many Jewish rabbis taught that Abraham had been justified because of his works. But Paul in Romans 4 demonstrates that Abraham was justified apart from both the law and works and thus was proof of justification by faith. And he'll go on to point this out a little more further. Yeah. I find myself getting really hung up on the term justification and what was the other one? So What's another term? What does that really mean? Let's look at his definition at the back. Okay. He does really good definitions here. <laughs> so if you happen to have a book, 169, bottom of the page. Justified justification. God's declaration from his position as judge of all the world that someone is in the right despite universal sin. This declaration will be made on the last day on the basis of an entire life, Romans 2, 1 through 16, but is brought forward into the present on the basis of Jesus' achievement because sin has been dealt with through his cross, Romans 3, 21 through 4, 25. The means of this present justification is simply faith. This means particularly that Jews and Gentiles alike are full members of the family promised by God to Abraham. References Galatians 3 and Romans 4. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll just add a note to that. Um, the reason that, th that he switches from saying righteousness and being right before God, yeah. which is the words that we understand better, is because we don't have a word like rightified. That it, right. it co justified comes from the Latin translation of the Vulgate and so that's where the confusion comes is that justification and righteousness are the same thing okay. but we don't have that we can't switch righteousness to rightification and we don't have just <laughs> you know justification we don't have a rightification we just don't have the two words okay. so the two words together are the same thing okay. but um, it's just the way our English language is. And then the other thing just there to notice is he also points to King David as further support of this argument. And <coughs> King David, um, as we know, he made a few mistakes along the way, right? <laughs> yeah, the Bathsheba thing, there are just a few little things where he kind of gets off the road. But he stays in right relationship with God and there is that love there. So now Romans chapter 4 verses 9 through 12 Abraham the father of both the uncircumcised and the circumcised. In Romans 4 9 through 12 Paul anticipates the argument of circumcision as a seal of righteousness and observes that God reckoned Abraham's faith as righteousness 
before he was circumcised. Um, a lovely metaphor that N.T. Wright uses is when two people get married. Um, in our time and culture, this was not always the case. Um, there is a ring, and this ring symbolizes the covenant made between two people, right? That's why um, we wear a ring. So if somebody else says, oh, this person's made a covenant with somebody else. I'm not going to ask her out to dinner with me, right? <laughs> that's, that's part of it. So he, he points out that the relationship came before the symbol, the circumcision. Now I'm reading scripture. In this blessedness, then, pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised, we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the ancestor of all, emphasize all, who believe without being circumcised and who thus have righteousness reckoned to them. And likewise, the ancestor of the circumcised who are not only circumcised, but who also follow the example of the faith that our ancestor Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now, we are a group of women here, <laughs> and this, um, I know I'm being recorded, but there is a focus <laughs> on male anatomy and I mean, my grandmother grew up in a time, she was born in 1899. Women could barely own property and they couldn't vote, right? Our um, anatomy meant that we were treated separately. I think one of the cool things about this when it talks about the uncircumcised is guess what? That's inclusive of all of us, not just <laughs> Gentiles, but women, these outward symbols that are so important, and I'm not saying that it's not important, but what I'm saying is this doesn't get in the way for all of us who are gathered here. Um, N.T. Wright makes an interesting observation on page 71 about membership in Abraham's family on the basis of faith. So let me just get to that. Membership in Ab oh, bottom of 71. Membership in Abraham's family is on the basis of faith. And by faith, he clearly means the faith he will describe in detail at the end of this chapter. Faith that finds its focus on Jesus and his resurrection as the great covenant renewing act of the one true God all of this will be explored further in Romans chapters 9 through 11. Then he goes on to make what I think is a very salient point for our time today. The church today and in every generation must make sure the door is wide enough open to let in people of every ethnic group, every type of family, every geographical region, every sort of moral or immoral background. But it must also make sure that the divining characteristic of the membership for this multi-ethnic family remains firmly stated and adhered to, the faith that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Keeping this balance and doing so in the right spirit remains a major task facing Christians in the 21st century. In the questions he has there, he also comes back to this. I'm hoping in our small groups, we can spend some time with that. Because that's 
really important mm -hmm. and it helps us get a move beyond just me and my individual faith and my recognizing that I should be able to walk into every and any Christian church in this town and even if they don't accept me, I need to be able to find God there. That's part of my work. I can't just judge, oh, well, they don't do this or I don't like their music or blah, 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 blah. But where is God here? Because God is there. And what what's the garbage in me that keeps me from seeing that? And that, I think, is an important part of our walk. I am all for you being in a church that you love and feeling a part of your church community. So I'm not trying to advocate that we not thoroughly appreciate and enjoy being in our community of faith. I think we need it to be real and to have real relationship. I'm just inviting us to see our Christian identity as a lot bigger than me and God or me and my little church, but recognize we are part of a family. And I think that's the direction that Paul legitimately is going here. All right. Um, <clears throat> Romans 4, 13 through 17 considers the larger meaning of Abraham as the father of all believers. We are a part of something much bigger than ourselves, our people, or even our time. Quote, for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only the adherents of the law, but also those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist end of this scripture there so um, very very powerful there and then the last thing Abraham of uh, Romans 4 18 through 25 Abraham's faith in ours um, and just a little preface so you can listen for this Paul sees God's work in the world as all of one continuous effort there is the macro story of God at work in the world. Every once in a while, you'll encounter a church, and to hear them say it, they've gone back to Jesus's time and no intervening history has occurred. They've just picked it up from there and they've got it right. And it's a lovely fantasy, but we, <laughs> we live in history, we live in the world. So might it be profitable for us to try to come to an understanding of history of seeing where is God working in the world and what can I learn from that? Just throwing out that idea. And uh, N.T. Wright observes, page 79, Abraham believed that God would give life where there was none. Christians believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. In both cases, it can only be a recognition that God is God, that our life and the life of the world are in his hand, and that he, ha that he has already begun his new creation and invites us to trust him to carry it through to the end. And now I'll read that scripture. Hope. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. So 
there we are. And at the very end here on page 80, he asks a series of wonderful questions. Do we share Abraham's faith? 80. 80 right uh, before you get to the chapter 5 of Romans. Do we share Abraham's faith? Do we look in love, gratitude, and trust to the Creator God who promises impossible things and brings them to pass? Have we learned to celebrate this God and to live as one family with all those who share this faith and hope? So on this 500th anniversary of the Christian Reformation, even as we celebrate our denominations and how they came out of that, I invite us, on the other hand, to also recognize the deep sadness up until then, reform had happened within the Roman Catholic Church. And believe me, a priest, Martin Luther, did not see himself as starting a new tradition. He thought of himself as reforming the Roman Catholic Church. But we have turned into Christians who just keep separating and separating and separating. And I think we need to really look at that. And why is it that so many young people aren't in church today? They look and they see all these separate nuanced views and they're missing the love of God and that big picture. And what might God be doing in our time and how might we be a part of bringing people together in Christ and sharing that love in a way that speaks to the vibrancy of our Lord. Okay, I'm a minute over, but pretty darn close. All right.